Where do I begin? According to the order I have in front of me and you have, it's a welcome. And when I thought about welcoming and as I just walked in, I thought about the atmosphere. I thought about this sanctuary. And I thought about each of us. I talked to a couple of pastors earlier this week and both of them happen to be pastors of church plants or new churches. And one of the things they said to me was, you know, it's kind of different because we don't do those kind of services anymore. We just kind of focus on Easter Sunday and we focus on Sunday. And it made me think that the whole point of what we're doing here it's supposed to be different. And so again, the lighting is different and the songs are different. And I believe in my heart that our attitude is called to be different. Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday. A lot of people say, what are you saying, Monday, Thursday? What's Monday, Thursday? I wonder if you, if you thought about it, could tell them what is Monday, Thursday. Could you explain to them, oh, I was at church last night, or I'm going to church today, or, or whatever. But I want to welcome you here, but I don't want it to be church. I don't want it to be worship. I don't want it to be, this is another one of those same old, same olds. What I want for each of us is that we truly, truly set aside what is the norm and look for the unexpected. I can't do that for you. I can do it for myself, but I can't do it for you. And so I by way of welcome, I am so glad to see you all. It is a blessing to be here together. And I am glad that we can worship here. But I want you to take a moment. And before we begin with the old rugged cross, I want you to just settle yourself. Again, I don't say this by way of guilt or anything, okay? But I think I just heard a phone, right? Turn the phones off. 
turn off your calendar of, oh, we're going to go out to coffee after this, and we're going to go. Turn off, oh, tomorrow's got this coming. Turn off, oh, I, I forgot to do this. Turn, turn off all of that. And when we sing, sing the words here, not here and here. When we take the element and you hold them, hold them. When you partake, again, let them come into you. But don't let this just be another day, another worship service. I welcome you to experience Something new. So take a moment. I want you to just close your eyes. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Let go of all that's rattling around in your head. Listen to the quietness. Lord, we come to you this evening with open hearts and open minds, open spirit, that in some way you would touch us so that we might be different people, so that we might be inspired to share the good news, so that this experience would touch us. Touch us. We pray it in your name. Amen. I know the screen is down, which sometimes we say, oh, well, we can't see the, can't see the stained glass. I'm glad. Because again, that stained glass is pretty. And it's warm, and it's welcoming. But I'm guessing it's very different than the cross that Christ would hang on. And so again, let's get there. The old rugged cross. Verses 1 and 3.
please be seated. What does it mean to you? And again, I want you to think about it. What does it mean to you? When you think about that old rugged cross and when you think about coming to this communion table, what does it mean to you? When we come together and we think about a liturgy, you've heard me say it before. We come together in remembrance. Especially this week when we think about Easter and when we think about Christ going to the cross, we remember that journey. We come together on Thursday because we think about that upper room. We think about Jesus gathering the disciples together. We think about Jesus washing their feet. We think about the confusion that must have been in their head. We remember the journey into the garden. We remember Peter and the rebuke. We remember the prayer and the stumbling. We remember the pain and the blood, the beating. We remember. And tonight, do you remember? Can you again close your eyes and see that journey to the cross? But not only do we remember, we commune. And again, this is an odd piece of theology. From tradition to tradition, there's different ideas of what it means. Some Christians believe that it's literally becoming the blood and the body of Christ. Others believe there's some kind of a spiritual presence like we do. But the point is the same. That when we come to the communion table, we come because we meet Christ in a very personal and a real way. Via the Holy Spirit, now more than ever, Christ is right before you. So when you take these elements and you hold that bread or you hold that cup, it's almost like holding the baby Jesus in your hands. Looking at that child, knowing that that child was born so that we might live. It's almost, if you can even imagine, like reaching up to take his body off of that cross, bringing it down to the ground and carrying it in your hands. Communion. Communion with Christ. But also communion with one another and the saints. Can you see yourself there at the cross with Mary? Can you see yourself in the crowd and hear them chanting, crucify Him, crucify Him? You are in communion with one another. With those who have gone before and those who will come after. Those who are globally celebrating. We are one. We are a people of God. We remember. We commune. And we hope. Tonight. I don't want you to hope too much. That's for Sunday. For Sunday, when we can be reminded of the words, and with an unveiled face, we shall behold Him. We shall be made like unto Him. That's after Sunday. So right now we hope. It's just a little... 
just a little that the prophecies all made sense and lined up. That the ministry of Jesus really shaped things. That Him explaining His need to go away to His disciples and they could follow just a little bit of hope. Until Sunday. We remember. We commune. We hope. Just a little. All things are ready. They've been brought together. They've been gathered together so that we might be one. You are welcome at this table if you know him as your Savior and Lord. Let's pray together. Lord God, we're going to partake. And in partaking, I pray that your Holy Spirit rests upon each of us. Rests upon each of us. That we might feel your presence that we might remember, that we might commune, that we might hope just a little. Lord, let this meal nourish us spiritually. We pray this in your name. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross. The same night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. As often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. Nothing but the blood.
It was just a piece of bread back then. It's just a piece of bread now. We probably throw away more than this than we eat. It's really nothing. Or is it something? Tonight, the Holy Spirit, Holy Week, the journey of Christ, a newness in your heart. It's just a piece of bread. Is it just a piece of bread? He handed it to his disciples just like it's been handed to you. They were confused. You know the story. Their lives were changed. What about yours? This is Christ's body given for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of him. In the same manner, after they had the bread, they took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new testament in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Again, he shed his blood. He gave it all. He didn't spare a drop for you and for me. Are you washed in the blood?
talked about this in Sunday school class a few weeks ago. I mean, you hold in your hand a cup of juice. If you're like me, you can kind of smell it. If you need to, take a minute. and It smells nice. We talked about what the cross would have been like. The sweat, the blood, the release of other bodily functions, it probably stunk. And yet here we sit, nice and neat, fresh juice, we drink it and we move on. It's that smelly stench that gives us a New Testament in our lives. A new beginning. A chance to be born again and have that hope that nothing can take away. Where are you at right now? This is Christ's blood shed for you. Take and drink it. A blessing or a curse? People say that a lot. Well, I don't know. Is this a blessing or a curse? Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, 
through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What do you hear, a blessing or a curse? I mean, the title of this section is Benediction, which we often hear as a blessing, a final greeting. But what struck me as I read these words and I reflected on this evening is a little word, and it's called accountability. Again, we've spent weeks moving towards this weekend. We've been asked to think about filling up a bag, a brown bag of Lenten ideas on this journey, of commitments of how to know Christ and God more in our lives and serve more. Well, guess what? Now comes this passage. What am I getting at? What this passage says is, may God equip you. Sure, it's a blessing, but it's also accountability. That if we call ourselves followers of Christ, if we truly believe in what we have just taken part in, then we have been equipped equipped with everything good for doing his will. You have been equipped. Have you been doing his will? Right now, you have been equipped even more. Are you going to leave here doing his will. You see, it's a blessing or is it a curse? We can sit here and say, oh, look, oh, we've been given everything we need. Thank you. But we've been given everything good to do His will. When you look at the last six weeks of Lent, how would you grade yourself? When you look at the year, how would you grade yourself? When you look at when the alarm went off this morning until right now, how would you grade yourself in using what he has equipped you with to do his will? Is this a blessing or is this a curse? And it doesn't stop. It says, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Who's in control of your life? Who is driving the ship? A sad example and illustration entered our reality this week. When a huge ship lost control, hit a bridge, and lives were lost. They lost their steering. The anchor couldn't help. There was no power. How about you and me? Are we doing the work? Are we letting God move within us? Or do we think we can pilot the ship? Because we will for sure be set off course. We will hit the rocks. But if we allow Him to work in us what is pleasing to him, then we are alive in Christ. And so again, when you look at Lent, when you look at the year, when you look at since the alarm went off this morning, who's been guiding the ship? 
Who has been motivating the work? Have we allowed for Him to work in us what is pleasing? Why? So that Christ might receive glory forever and ever. It doesn't get more simple than this. Look at your day to day. Have you glorified God and Christ? Have you lifted up the beauty of the season? Have you shared by way of your actions and your life what it means to be saved and be a child of God? When people looked at you today, did they say, wow, wow, something's different and God receives some glory? You see, is this a blessing? Or is this a curse? Because if, if we claim to have just met Him, broke bread, drank from the cup, then we're making a commitment to this challenge. To use what He's equipped us with. To let Him work inside of us. And to show the world what it means to glorify God in all things. If you go online tonight, look up King Charles. He gave a little speech today. Because they celebrate Monday, Thursday, and part of a tradition that goes way back in England is that he gives out Monday gifts. Little amounts of money that he gives out to, I believe it's 150 people. And it's a gift because these people, in his mind, have most shown through what it means to serve others because of Christ. Now again, I'm not talking about giving out rewards to you all. But I think it's fascinating that on a night like tonight, they look at those people who have used the things that God has given, those people who have allowed God to work in them, those people who have most glorified God, and they give Him a token so that they might remember what it means, and He mentions this, when He was coronated, He said, that it was not that he was to be served, but that he was to be a king who served others. That's what it's all about. That we serve others. That again, we do what it says here, but understand, is it a blessing or is it a curse? Because there is accountability for the cup that we just drank, for the bread that we just ate, and for these words that call us to equip, be equipped, to allow God to work and to glorify God at every turn. How about it? When you think about the last six weeks, the last year, when you think about since the alarm went off, have you been a blessing or a curse? Amen. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you give us hope and you bless us you protect us, you love us, and that you challenge us. 
And it's only through your grace, it's only through your love, it's only through the blood of Christ that we even have a chance to live for you now and into eternity. Lord, the power is in the blood that we might receive that power tonight. In your name, amen. There's power in the blood. Receive this blessing. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.